emergency. By definition, a sudden and unexpected event. It can take many forms. On a large or small scale. In any case, the effects can be catastrophic. Unless you've planned. Unless you expect the unexpected. The main obstacle to emergency planning is apathy. The belief that fires or chemical spills or accidents only happen to others. But many organizations have recognized the advantages of emergency planning and the dangers of apathy. Dr. Russell Dines is co-director of the Disaster Research Center at University of Delaware. Since 1964, he's studied how people behave during emergencies. The way to overcome apathy, he says, is to develop an emergency consciousness in the workplace. So I, I think that the first step is simply to appoint someone or some group of people to start thinking about the matter as, as a part of their occupational responsibility, not something which is tangential and trivial to the organization, but is central to it. Firefighters are on the front lines in nearly all emergencies. They deal firsthand with the dangers of emergency events and their consequences. To them, the case for emergency planning is open and shut. Archie Stacy has been a firefighter for more than 30 years. Before retiring in 1989, he was the fire chief for the District of North Vancouver. It's most important to develop an emergency plan that provides for the safety of the employees and the protection of the property and down the line in terms of the environment, which is really important today. Jim Lamort is an emergency planning consultant in Victoria. He describes an emergency plan as a guide that provides quick answers in a crisis. It's something that you can pull off the shelf and, and say, OK, I want to solve this problem. How do I do it? Who do I contact? What equipment do they have or do I need? And what kind of activities should take place? Lance Olmsted is the emergency planner for the municipality of Saanich and a consultant to industry and government. In his view, a plan should be a flexible series of activities that employees can perfect through trial runs. Uh, you can practice it. You can look at it and see if it's logical. You can see whether it's achievable. If it isn't, you can modify it and you can get it so that it is effective when you actually have a disaster. And that's what's important if you're to save people. Bob Jansen is a field officer with the Workers' Compensation Board. He works with companies in developing safety programs. When you have a, a safety program in place at a, at a workplace and it's effective and well executed and well managed, managed and workers are involved in it and workers are part of the system, when an emergency happens, it can be dealt with in a controlled manner. Planning begins by looking at the kinds of events that can threaten you, a process called hazard analysis. Jim Lamort. Well, there's, there's probably the big three, and, and that's fire, theft and uh, chemical spills. Those are the biggest ones that happen in industry in general. There's uh, some other major ones of concern, especially on the West Coast, an earthquake. Um, if you're close to a river, a flood zone, <clears throat> you can even be flooded out through a municipal water system if there happens to be a major break in it and the water can enter a basement and ruin equipment, etc. So flood is a serious concern. Once hazards to an organization are identified, a response can be planned. A key element in effective emergency planning is known as hazard reduction or mitigation. Its benefits can be measured in saved lives, reduced injuries, and lessened property damage. Many community agencies offer guidance on hazard reduction. For example, the Workers' Compensation Board can help in establishing a workplace hazardous materials safety program. Well, an employer may, has already probably put in place a women's program we can come in and help them streamline the program, look for inconsistencies, deficiencies, and the like. So we can look at, assess the situation. We may do a walkthrough of the, of the uh, location, the plant itself, look at the chemicals in use, and then we'll assess their 
their files uh, of information, the material safety data sheets, look at how they label things, and look at how all that information is applied to the workers. Firefighters can also be consulted. Along with fire safety training, they advise businesses on topics like safe storage and handling of chemicals. They can determine if there's a danger of toxic gas release should chemicals accidentally mix and demonstrate the safe use of breathing apparatus. Okay, what we've got here is a spot air pack. And this, this is for use uh, basically any place where you'd be in a confined space or any place where you might have some toxic gas that you want to protect yourself from so you didn't have to... Hazard reduction exposure. includes many different activities. For example, backing up copies of vital business records, ventilation control to remove hazardous vapors, or locating shutoff valves for gas and water, to name a few. Simply put, hazard reduction is an exercise in problem solving. Some solutions are surprisingly inventive, where a small investment of time and money can result in large savings if an emergency occurs. Take a computer sitting on the edge of a desk. Lance Olmsted recommends anchoring it with an inexpensive anti-skid pad that can be bought at a marine supply store. Uh, the, the benefit of putting that underneath means that if there's an earthquake, it's not going to fall off the table. Because if it falls off the table, you are not only going to have to buy a new one when you can get one, because everybody else's will have fallen off at the same time if it's an earthquake. Uh, are you able to conduct your business without having a, a computer system? Hazard analysis and reduction lead directly to action. What should people within your organization do during a crisis? Dr. Russell Dine says the answers are revealed by imagining what could happen in specific circumstances. What things might be needed? How do we deal with, uh, with particular types of problems? If we're going to have an evacuation, how do we handle that? If we need sheltering for people, how are we going to be handle that? An effective safety training program will help provide employees with the skills needed during an emergency. In fact, an emergency plan is incomplete without that training, according to Lance Olmsted. How can you possibly deal with a major incident uh, where people will be injured if you don't have a first aid course, if you don't have CPR, if you don't have search and rescue skills? Experience has shown that if employees are trained to handle a major emergency, they'll also be prepared for the workplace accidents that are more likely to happen. Jim Lamort. Uh, a person cuts his leg and you've got somebody right there who knows first aid treatment and can minimize the damage, minimize the injury so that person heals quicker and gets back on the job quicker. So you have less downtime for, for that personnel. Also there's a, an added benefit of, of uh, confidence among the workers. If they have some training in emergency response, they definitely get the impression that management cares about their health and well-being. But an emergency plan is only words on paper until it's been tested. Chief Archie Stacy. Uh, the testing of, a, of a, an emergency plan is, is, is a key element to the success of an emergency. If, if an emergency occurs <clears throat> in your plant and employees aren't familiar with the, with the emergency plan of that particular agency, then it probably won't work. It likely won't work. Testing an emergency plan can cover a wide variety of activities. The simplest is a paper exercise where members of the emergency team go over a scenario outlined in the plan, reminding themselves of their responsibilities. A more complex test is a full-blown evacuation drill with all employees involved. This enables them to become familiar with the procedures laid out in the plan. An example of how testing a plan can pay off is the case of the First Interstate Bank of California. In 1988, its 62-story headquarters in downtown Los Angeles was struck by a catastrophic fire. It burned for more than four hours, destroyed five floors, and caused more than $50 million worth of damage. The worst high-rise fire in the city's history. But the bank's emergency plan was in place and had been tested just three weeks before. As a result, Less than an hour after the fire began, key decision makers were at work in the bank's Emergency Operations Center, or EOC as it's known. Elaine Kissel, the bank's manager for emergency planning, credits the test for the bank's smooth response and recovery. 
We had had our exercise, they knew where to go, they knew what to do, they knew what their role was. And there was no turf battles, no inner fighting, it, uh, it just worked perfectly well. Then we had the recovery phase, which was, you know, took months to orchestrate. And so the business resumption planning unit, which is a different unit from my unit, um, my unit is called emergency planning, theirs is business resumption planning. They um, took over the use of the EOC, utilizing the same concept of gathering information, setting priorities, and uh, beginning to solve problems. They utilized that EOC for approximately six weeks on a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week basis in order to be able to get things um, um, back to, to working conditions. If the plan hadn't existed, you know, we would have probably had a, a lot more chaotic kind of activity going on. Uh, people would not have gathered themselves together in an EOC. They would have been doing their own thing separately in their own um, office environment, trying to solve problems without knowing what the big picture was. And I'm sure that um, we would not have been able to, to get ourselves back up and running in the timely manner that we did. Um, you know, we even made money th the next day. How does a smaller organization with its own specific needs handle emergency planning? Metro McNair Laboratories has 52 labs and offices in British Columbia. Its 400 employees routinely work with hazards like dangerous chemicals and medical specimens. As well, lab personnel are responsible for the handling of confidential records. As operations manager Diane Trevinsky explains, the first step for the lab's emergency planning group was to set priorities. Well, our top priority was the safety of our employees. That was number one on the list. After that, we looked at recovery of operations and a complete restart if that was necessary. The planning group gathered information and advice from community resources like the Workers' Compensation Board, BC Hydro, police, fire, and other municipal departments. They learned that they needed to look beyond the safety program already in place. Well, on an ongoing basis, we have a fully integrated safety program, and that uh, handles chemical spills, evacuation procedures in case of fire, uh, that sort of thing. When we looked at it from the point of view of disaster, we were looking at a much broader picture, anything from um, any kind of natural disaster right up to employees being ill from the flu or a postal strike anything of that nature. We have two, uh, two manuals, one for our central lab location, which does not handle patients, and another one for our branch locations. The branch locations have included things like what, from the police, local police departments, how to look at a robbery suspect and, and remember what uh, his features were like or her features were like. We uh, have in the book a, a quick reference guide so that people can quickly go down a table of contents to look for uh, the kind of emergency that they may be in. We also have included um, a checklist style action plan for any manager or supervisor or person who is first on the scene so that they can quickly run through all the things that they're supposed to do which you can't always remember when you're in the middle of a stressful situation. Nearly all businesses are protected by insurance but without an emergency plan Insurance alone won't necessarily provide complete protection. Jim Lamort. You think your buildings or your, your equipment are costly and valuable. The people are, are the mainstay of any kind of business. And if you injure, especially key personnel, and it may be somebody who's not paid that much, but they know the computer system inside and out. If you lose that person, <clears throat> you're in serious trouble. Emergency planning will certainly cost time and money. And although an emergency is rare, when it occurs, a plan provides the advantage that can save lives, maintain jobs, and help prevent business failure. But on a day-to-day -day basis, an effective emergency plan provides something that's difficult to put a price on. Security. From the point of view of the employees, if there was an incident that, that occurred, if the company were, were able to restart relatively quickly, 
I would think that uh, the security of a paycheck is a, a good motivating factor. The other type of security is, is more of a humanitarian uh, feeling that as a business, as an institution, we are responsible not only to the general public, but especially to our workers, to our workforce, to our employees. They rely upon us to develop a, a safe environment to work in, and uh, we have a moral responsibility to do that.